Welcome to this presentation. Today we'll be covering blood and this comes from Blossom uh, chapter 18. Uh, specifically we're only going to be looking at 18.1, 18.2, and uh, 18.3 and 18.4. So do not worry about anything in hemostasis. That's a fancy word for blood clotting and the processes of blood clotting. And we're also not going to be discussing blood typing. So we're going to be hanging out in sections one through four. This will complement some of the material that you're learning in one of the cardiovascular labs. And let's take a look. Uh, so let me just start right here. Uh, you've already learned some things about blood. And in this black and white photograph, I am looking at three different, what we call formed elements, three different cellular type things that are found in blood. And you'll see these over and over here in this next hour. This is a red blood cell. And uh, I know that for a couple of reasons. One, it has this indentation. And if I flip this over, I would see the same indentation. So it's called a biconcave cell. This smaller structure here, this is the platelet. And then here, this is a white blood cell. So we're going to take a look at these. We're going to learn about the different types of cells. We're going to be learning about the composition of blood, what blood does, and let's get started. So blood. Um, the first thing I want you to remember is that blood is a connective tissue. I know it is not sort of seem typical that a liquid would be a connective tissue, but there are two liquid connective tissues. There's blood and there's lymph. And we know that those are very similar. And um, the, uh, they're both considered connective tissues. Remember that a connective tissue is simply made up of loosely arranged cells with a cellular, an extracellular matrix around it. Okay, so blood definitely uh, meets the definition of a connective tissue. You have loosely arranged cells like the red cells and the white cells surrounded by an extracellular matrix in this case that is called plasma. So what do we find in blood? First, there's the cellular elements. Uh, the cellular elements are more officially referred to as the formed elements. And the formed elements are red blood cells, white blood cells, and cellular fragments called platelets. So those are the three formed elements. And what we'll discover as we go to a little bit more detail is that platelets are not cells at all. They are fragments of other cells and red blood cells, to be honest, don't even meet all of the expected requirements for a cell. The reason being red blood cells don't have a nucleus. So mature red blood cells don't have a nucleus. They really don't have much of a metabolism and they cannot reproduce without that nucleus. So red blood cells, uh, while we call them cells, certainly aren't typical. Here is a quick look at the formed elements of blood. We're going to take a look at each of these in more detail, but first we have red blood cells. Red blood cells are in fact red in color, and that is a natural color that comes from a pigment found in the red blood cells called hemoglobin. And we'll talk more about hemoglobin in a moment. Notice the shape. We call that biconcave. This uh, looks like an indentation on both sides. Then there are platelets. They can be uh, smooth and flat little fragments like this, or once a platelet has been activated and is actively involved in clotting blood, it gets these extensions. So these are unactivated platelets, and then these are activated platelets. And then finally, we have white blood cells. And white blood cells come in five basic flavors. And I'm going to introduce these to you in a very introductory way. And then in uh, physiology, you'll have a chance to do quite a bit more with blood. But we have monocytes, lymphocytes. Lymphocytes you heard a little bit about in the lymphatic system discussion. Uh, lymphocytes come in a couple different flavors, like the T cells, the B cells, the plasma cells, 
the NK cells. We won't be uh, diving into great detail about these. Uh, then there's eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils. And each of the white blood cells has a job. Um, it has a particular job or multiple jobs. For example, and we'll get back to this, but for example, neutrophils are the type of white blood cell that reaches out and destroys bacteria. Whereas eosinophils are the cells that reach out and destroy uh, parasites. Okay, uh, Lymphocytes are, some of them make antibodies and some of them are uh, anti-cancer type cells and antiviral type cells. And then monocytes uh, typically become macrophages. And we've seen a few macrophages this semester. We've seen, for example, osteoclasts that chewed up bone. We've seen the Langerhans cells that wander around in the, in the epidermis. Uh, we've seen um, microglial cells, which are little phagocytic cells as well. And all of those macrophage type cells are actually derived from monocytes, which are one of the types of white blood cells. Now, the other name for white blood cells are the leukocytes. The other name for the red blood cells we'll see are the erythrocytes. And the other names sometimes given for platelets are thrombocytes. So let's first look at the functions of blood. I don't think this will be terribly surprising, although there may be a few new ideas in here. So the first thing when we think about blood, we think that it travels throughout the blood vessels and it's delivering oxygen. And that's absolutely true. It's also delivering nutrients. So the, red, the, the blood is delivering oxygen. The blood is delivering nutrients. The blood is also the blood is also transporting hormones. Okay, let me not forget to hit that save button again. But we've got oxygen, right, being delivered to our tissues. And we're also uh, sending those hormones around the body. Most hormones are, tr are transported through the blood. And we also, uh, the blood is also picking up cellular waste products and byproducts and transports those back as well. So lots and lots of things that are being carried in the blood. Number two, defense. The white blood cells specifically, right, are about defending your body as part of the lymphatic system. And some of the white blood cells are able to destroy bacteria. Some of them are able to um, pick up and detect cancerous cells that are being formed. Remember, we're making cancer cells every day, and those cancer cells are usually detected and destroyed by our immune system. These white blood cells, some of them, are the cells that we can thank for that. And we also have white blood cells that fight off viruses. In addition to lymphatic or immune responses, uh, when you damage a blood vessel and it begins to bleed, the platelets are activated and they begin to cause a blood clot. And so that's another defense, right, or protective mechanism. We defend against disease and we defend against blood loss. Blood is incredibly important in helping to maintain your body temperature. Uh, we talked about this way, way back uh, in the early chapters about just homeostasis, the idea that uh, your blood vessels in your skin would vasoconstrict to, re to uh, maintain heat in your body and would vasodilate to release that heat. So uh, blood is very important in helping to maintain the, the, the body temperature. And there are many other uh, substances found in your blood that are important in maintaining the pH of your blood and the pH of your body tissues. Uh, very important. If your pH of your blood, the acidity of your blood changes uh, by more or less than half a point, you're dead. Uh, so there's a lot of regulation to maintaining your blood pH. 
Okay, so those are the main functions of blood. What is blood made up of? So in addition to, we've already said this, but in addition to the formed elements, there's also the liquid portion. Again, that's the plasma. So we have the formed elements, the white cells, the red cells, and the platelets, and there is the plasma. Let me tell you how you can sort of see this more visually. Uh, one can perform a hematocrit. Now, hematocrit has two meanings. Hematocrit is the name for actual test, but when you do the test hematocrit, you're actually measuring a hematocrit value. The hematocrit value is measuring the percentage of red blood cells in a blood sample. Okay, and we're going to see this in a moment, how this is seen. So you take a, a sample of blood, usually just a, a couple of mils of blood or even less, and you spin them in a centrifuge. And what that's going to do is it's going to cause the heavier substances in the blood to to head down to the bottom of the sample and the lighter elements are going to hang out on the top. So when you do a hematocrit, and this video will describe this to you, you get the red blood cells on the bottom. Okay, so they're going to go to the bottom. They're just the heaviest of the blood cells. And then you're also going to see a very thin layer. This is made up of the white blood cells and thrombocytes, the platelets, and that layer is called the buffy coat. And then everything above the buffy coat is going to be sort of a watery substance. And that watery, sort of pale, straw-colored fluid, it's like a, a very pale yellow. Uh, that fluid on the top is the plasma. Okay, so the plasma is the pale fluid on the top of the tube. So when you do this, I'll show you the visual here. So you start off with just a vial of blood. You spin that blood for five to 10 minutes in a centrifuge. And as you can see, the red blood cells go to the bottom. This interface here, it's not very big at all. Sort of the interface between the layers is called the buffy coat. And that is where the white blood cells and the platelets are gonna pellet out. And then everything above it in that light yellow fluid is the plasma. Now in the plasma, it's mostly water. There's some proteins in there, there's some nutrients, there's hormones, everything that's dissolved in your blood is gonna hang out up here in the plasma. In a normal blood sample, we're going to see that for males, males, uh, the normal hematocrit is 42% to 52%. What that means is that when you spin the blood, you basically look at this as the total volume of the blood, and then you say, what percentage of that total blood volume is made up of red blood cells? And that red blood cell percentage is your hematocrit value. And you can just eyeball this, and you can see that there is just a little bit less than 50%. Do you agree? If I look at all of this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of these little dashes, and this is about one, two, three, four, right? It's a little bit less than 50%. So yes, this would be a normal hematocrit for a male, right? Because a normal hematocrit for male is between 42 and 52%. Now women are going to have a lower hematocrit only 37 to 47. This is the most numbers uh, that you're going to see in any of the units this semester. So the numbers that I'm describing are important for you to learn. And this might be one of those things that you pull a few extra note cards out and make some flashcards. But for the normal female hematocrit, 37 to 47%. If a person does it, you know, they take the blood and they perform the hematocrit test and they see that the red blood cell numbers are very, very low, we would say that that person is anemic. Okay, they have a depressed hematocrit. If a woman had a hematocrit less than 37%, we would call her anemic. If a guy had a hematocrit less than 42%, we would say that he has anemia. 
Now, what if we do the hematocrit and the red blood cells are actually more? And you can clearly see that the red blood cells are making up well over 50, more like 60 something percent of the total volume here. And in that case, we would say that the person has polycythemia. Polycythemia. Uh, emia, remember from the vocab, emia means a condition of the blood. So we have a condition of the blood where there's an abundance, poly, many, cytos. And so the uh, when there's more than, more than the expected number of red blood cells, we call it polycythemia. This is not as common. Uh, anemia is quite common. And we'll talk more about this. So this is your hematocrit. Do you know the percentages from normal male and normal female. What else do we know about blood? Or let's learn a few more things about blood. Number one, freshly oxygenated blood. Blood that is just returning from the lungs and blood that is sent out through the aorta and out our major arteries. Before that blood delivers oxygen, that is bright red blood. So as long as the blood is highly oxygenated, it is bright red. However, once the blood has released its oxygen in the tissues, it becomes a duskier red or what I usually call a bricky or, or sort of a burnt red looking color. Uh, this is the color of blood you see if you've ever donated blood. You know that the blood that is provided into the bag is not a bright red. It's a much, uh, it's a much darker, almost burgundy color. And this is true also when you go to give blood um, for just a lab test. The blood they put into the tube is not a bright red blood. Now, when, when blood delivers oxygen to the tissues, it doesn't rob all of the oxygen out of the blood. But if there's less oxygen, we get that dark red blood. Now, what do we call that though in all of our diagrams? We're gonna call that deoxygenated blood and we're gonna color it as blue. Now, why in the world did anyone come up with the idea of showing our venous blood, right? Our deoxygenated blood as blue, because clearly it isn't blue, right? We do not have blue blood. But if you look on a pale person like myself and you look at your wrist and you look at your vessels, they appear blue, don't they? So sort of out of uh, just appreciation of that coloring, that bluish coloring, uh, venous blood has been shown to be blue. I don't think I mentioned this in the artery and vein conversation, but veins are more superficial. So what is at the surface of your body are veins. And I did discuss in the blood vessel chapter that veins are under very low pressure. So when you give blood, we go to a more superficial vessel. It's the deoxygenated blood and it's much easier to get to. It's under less pressure. It's not going to squirt all over the place. If you were to need blood from an artery, you would have to go deeper. So our arteries are deeper in our body. They're more protected because if you cut an artery, you are cutting, as you know, a high pressure vessel and that sucker is going to bleed. It's going to squirt blood. So long, long conversation here, but I wanted to make sure that I clarified that. Blood is rather viscous, okay? So we know blood is red. Blood is rather viscous. It's about four times or so thicker than water, okay? So we know it's thicker than water. Um, and here it's saying five times, but four to five times thicker than water. And its thickness comes from all of the proteins and the combination of all the formed elements that are found in the blood. Next, the temperature of blood is slightly more warm than your body temperature. Your body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Your blood temperature is about 38 degrees Celsius. So it's about one degree Celsius more, okay? Or nearly two degrees Fahrenheit warmer. And what this does is it actually 
uh, creates a warm place for an infection. One way to think about it. Not only does blood transfer and send heat around your body, right? But also, if you should get bacteria into your blood, blood is rich in nutrients and glucose, and blood is warm. So that's what bacteria like, right? So when a person gets bacteria entered into their bloodstream, it's just a ripe place for the bacteria to grow and for the patient to become septic. That is to have a blood infection. Here's what I found. Blood pH is 7.4. This is also an important number. It actually ranges between 735 and 745 incredibly important that your body maintains this very tight regulation over the pH of blood. So if our blood is pH 7.4, that means that our blood is slightly, slightly basic or slightly alkaline. Remember the pH scale goes from 0 to 14. 7, recall, was, was neutral. Pure water is defined as having a pH of 7. So blood has a pH of 7.4. It's slightly alkaline or slightly basic. And then finally, blood constitutes about 8% of your body weight. Okay, about 8% of your body weight. And a male typically would have between five and six liters of blood. Ladies, you're gonna have between four and five liters of blood. So a lot of numbers here. These numbers are important. So make sure that you're keeping track of these numbers. So those are the characteristics of blood. So we know that there are formed elements in the blood and there is plasma. We're going to look at the formed elements in the next sections. In this section, we're going to take a look at what is plasma and what is found in plasma. Number one, plasma is 92% water, right? Water, water, water mostly water, but it also, in that watery aqueous uh, environment, there's also proteins, okay? And everything else is floating around in the blood uh, is in very low concentrations, but we basically have water and proteins. Let's take a look at what those proteins are. About 7% of your plasma is made up of proteins. And those proteins come in basically three major groups. The first protein is albumin. Albumin. Now you may have heard of albumin before um, in another totally different conversation, but albumin is basically the main protein also found in egg whites. Okay. Um, but in you and me, uh, albumin is the most abundant. So AA albumin abundant, and it is made by the liver. Okay, so this is the protein that's made by the liver, and it has a number of very important jobs, but the one that I want you to know is that albumin is the most significant contributor to osmotic pressure. Now, that's just a fancy way of saying albumin is responsible for holding water inside blood vessels and albumin can also be responsible for drawing water out of blood vessels. So maintaining your fluid levels in your body and maintaining your uh, blood levels is largely the job of albumin. This also tells us that if the liver is failing, right? So because albumin is made in the liver, a person who has liver disease or a person who has some sort of cirrhosis or disease of the liver and the liver is no longer making albumin, that lower albumin will actually cause the buildup of fluid in the body. Okay, so one of the signs of a patient with liver damage or liver failure is a very large belly because the albumin is not made sufficiently and water leaks out of the blood vessels and into the interstitial spaces of the abdomen more commonly. 
So albumin, the most abundant, it makes up for about 54% or so of the, uh, of the proteins. The second most abundant group of proteins are a group called globulins. Globulins. Now, globulins come in all sorts of flavors. We, don't, we won't worry about this. Um, but the number one thing, you may, you may know globulins by another name, and that is globulins are your antibodies. Right, so antibodies are proteins produced by some of the lymphocytes, some of the white blood cells. And these antibodies, also called the immunoglobulins, are floating around and they are protecting you against invaders. So antibodies are what your body produces so that when a bacterium or a virus or some other sort of foreign antigen enters your body, your body is able to defend against it. This is the idea behind vaccines, right? When we get the, the COVID vaccine, the idea was the body would now produce antibodies against COVID so that if a person gets COVID, it would be able to fight off that COVID much more efficiently than a person who had not had the, the uh, vaccine. And then the least abundant protein is one called fibrinogen. Fibrinogen, like albumin, it's also made in the liver. It is an essential protein in the blood clotting process. We're not gonna be going into the nitty gritty of uh, the, blood pro the blood clotting process, but I want you to know fibrinogen is made and it, without it, again, uh, clotting is a problem. So a person, again, with liver damage would have a problem with blood clotting. Now I'm saying these things and I'm hoping that you're thinking, oh, that's a connection, right? There's a connection between uh, the liver and we always consider the liver part of the digestive system. So the liver, right, not only does digestion, but the liver is also very important in maintaining these blood proteins, both the albumin and the fibrinogen. This video will help describe this to you. What else is in plasma? Pretty much everything else. So if you think about something that's being carried through your blood, that could be electrolytes. I mean, meaning basically when you drink Gatorade, right? What are you drinking? After you sweat and work out, you drink some Gatorade, you restore the electrolytes. Electrolytes is just a general term, meaning sodium, potassium, calcium, and other types of ions. That's what it means for the electrolytes. Also, you've got gases like oxygen and CO2 in and traveling in your plasma. You've got vitamins, glucose, lipids, amino acids, metabolic wastes. All of those together only make up for about 1% of all of the plasma volume. So here's a nice table. Um, don't go crazy about memorizing everything in here, but what did I say? Plasma, let's look, at, first of all, blood, all blood. Blood, depending if you're male or female, the formed elements are somewhere between 37 and 54%. Let's just think about half, right? About half. And um, plasma, therefore, is the rest of it, okay? So I always think plasma is roughly, roughly 50% of your blood volume. The plasma, 92% water. 7% proteins, 1% all the other stuff. Those 7% proteins include albumins, the most abundant, globulins in the middle, those are the antibodies, and fibrinogen, important in cl blood clotting. Moving down, formed elements, there are red blood cells, they are by far the most abundant, there are white blood cells and platelets. Compared to red blood cells, they're relatively rare. They make up less than 1% of your formed elements. We'll go through these details here in a minute. And platelets, um, I don't know why we repeated that, but we have the erythrocytes, the leukocytes, the platelets shouldn't be here. And then the platelets are a separate type of formed element and they too make up less than 1%.
So that is the end of 18.1. Don't forget, you can do all of these lovely questions at the end and do some of these matching identification questions into vocab as well. Taking a look at 18.2, we're looking now at the formation of the formed elements. There's a little bit of overlap here also included in the lymphatic presentation. You'll learn just a little bit about the formation of formed elements. Now, what we're focusing on here is what is the difference between the a few facts about the lifespan of the formed elements? And we're only gonna do this very superficially. Um, some cells, some cells, um, like some of your white blood cells, man, they can go around for years, right? Some of those cells that make antibodies can hang out for years. This is why you only need the tetanus vaccine every seven to 10 years, because we know that those uh, cells that make those antibodies against tetanus hang around for a long time. Whereas other, uh, other vaccines you need to have more often. And we know that sometimes you need to have a booster as well. So white blood cells, not all of them, but some of them can hang out for years. Red blood cells, we're gonna see, um, or I should say most white blood cells are just a few hours to weeks. We're gonna look at more of the specific lifespans here in a minute of red cells and platelets. So be watching for those numbers as we get there. When you go to the blood bank and you donate blood, you're typically going to be giving about a pint, about 475 milliliters, half a liter, right, roughly. And you can replace that rather quickly. You can replace the plasma in about 24 hours. Remember, plasma is mostly water and plasma is cells. And those cells can be replaced rather, uh, the, sorry, the the take it back, the proteins. The proteins can also be replaced rather quickly, but it takes four to six weeks to replace all of the blood cells. And this is why you can only donate blood typically every six weeks or so if you are a frequent donor. The process of making blood is hemopoiesis. You'll also see it called hematopoiesis. And this word, um, hemo is blood, poiesis is the production of. And you know that hematopoiesis occurs in the bone marrow. So this is sort of a repeat going back to the skeletal system. Again, think connections, uh, but we have hematopoiesis occurring um, in you and me. It's only occurring in the red bone marrow. Our red bone marrow as adults is limited to the uh, flat bones and the proximal head of the humerus and the femur. In children, uh, there's more of this going on, okay? But in you and me, we have blood production happening in our flat bones of our crania, cranium, in our pelvis, vertebra, sternum, and again, those proximal epiphyses of both the femur and the humerus. How does this happen? I'm going to go into just a little bit of this information um, and go through some of these different terms. Again, all of your formed elements are formed from cells in your red bone marrow. So white cells, red cells, and platelets are all formed in your red bone marrow. How does this happen? There is a cell found in the early embryo, uh, well, let's let's back up. As we form the embryo, right? The the zygote or the fertilized egg is said to be totipotent, and what that means is that it has total potential to become any cell in your body. We talked a little bit about this way way back in the early chapters, but totipotent means that a cell has total potential to become anything, and that's why a zygote can develop into all of the cells that are found in you and me. The next level of, of uh, differentiation, when cells start becoming different, the next level is called pluripotent. And then finally there is multipotent. 
and then we get to um, oligopotent. In this hierarchy of stem cells, there is a cell called a hematopoietic stem cell, or more commonly a hemocytoblast. Let's make sure we make sh it makes sense to us, right? We know that hemo means blood. We know that cyto means cell, and that blast are cells from which other things are produced. So this is a cell that makes all the other blood cells. And all of your formed elements are made by hemocytoblasts. How this happens, we're not gonna go into the specific chemicals, but there are chemical signals and hormonal signals which are going to cause this hemocytoblast to differentiate. And the hemocytoblast can become one of two cells. It can either become a lymphoid stem cell, which is only going to give rise to other lymphocytes. So the T cells, the B cells, the natural killer cells, uh, all of those cells are formed from this lymphoid stem cell. And this process of making lymphocytes would be called lymphopoiesis. You can see a lot of poiesis words in this chapter, the formation of lymphocytes. Where does this happen? It, again, all of this starts in the bone marrow. Okay, it all starts in the bone marrow. We're gonna get down to a picture that's gonna make this easier. The hemocytoblast, again, either becomes that lymphoid stem cell or it becomes the myeloid stem cell. And the myeloid, I remember just many, M for many. The myeloid stem cell becomes many, many, or really all of the other multiple types of formed elements. So let's take a look at this table to make more sense of this. So in your bone marrow, you have a cell called a hemocytoblast. This is a stem cell. From this, all other blood cells will be derived. Based upon different chemical signals, this hemocytoblast will become either a myeloid stem cell or a lymphoid stem cell. If it becomes a lymphoid stem cell, it then goes through other changes to become all of the other types of lymphocytes, the natural killer cells, the T cells, and the B cells. Lymphoid stem cells only become lymphocytes, whereas, the myeloid stem cell are going to form eventually monocytes, eosinophils, neutrophils, basophils, erythrocytes, and is going to form these cells called megakaryocytes, which are the cells from which platelets are derived. So all of the other cells, right? The multiple types of cells are made by the myeloid side. We're not going to go into the chemical signals that are necessary for this to occur. Just remember again that this happens in the nucleus. A little video here to help you more appreciate this process. There is one hormone that I want to definitely discuss with you. And we'll hear about this hormone again when we get to the urinary system. And this hormone is erythropoietin, okay, or erythropoietin, you'll hear it pronounced both ways. It's abbreviated EPO. Now, this is a hormone produced by the kidneys in response to low oxygen levels. So, we haven't talked about the, I know we haven't talked about the kidneys yet, but you know that the kidneys filter your blood. Not only are they filtering your blood and getting rid of waste products that end up in our urine, but your kidneys are also monitoring the oxygen levels of your blood. Interesting, right? So the kidneys have this very important job of monitoring your oxygen levels. And when those oxygen levels are deemed to be too low, the kidney spits out this hormone called erythropoietin. Now the name of this hormone tells us exactly what it does. IN tells us that it's a protein that POIS, right, produces erythrocytes. So this hormone goes from the kidney, travels to the bone marrow, and tells your body to make more red blood cells. Very important. Now, this EPO is used clinically if a person has anemia, 
right? Low. Remember what anemia is? Anemia is low red blood cells. And we want to increase red blood cells because red blood cells are the cells that carry oxygen. So if a person's anemic, one way to improve that anemia is to give them EPO or to have their own body make more EPO. Another time where you hear about EPO is in performance enhancing drugs. Some athletes are desperate enough to do what's called blood doping. And what blood doping is, is that it's a process where they take synthetic EPO and they inject it into their, into their body, causing their body to make more red blood cells. Well, if you have more red blood cells, you have a higher hematocrit. If you have a higher hematocrit, that means you also have the ability of carrying more oxygen through your tissues. So it gives you an advantage, right? So to take EPO as a performance enhancing drug gives you an athletic advantage, especially in uh, sports like um, cycling or long distance running, where having more oxygen available to your muscles and your tissues is of great advantage. While I'm talking about this uh, synthetic EPO, the other thing that one can do to get more red blood cells is to go to high altitudes. Because at high altitudes, there is less, there is less uh, atmospheric pressure, which means when you fly to Denver, for example, the Mile High City, there's less atmospheric pressure pushing the oxygen into your lungs. As a consequence of that, you will have less oxygen being carried in your blood. The kidneys will sense that lower oxygenation and will kick up the production of EPO to form more red blood cells to correct this low level of oxygen. It takes about five days for this process to occur. Now that is why you may know that when professional football teams, for example, are playing the Denver Broncos, they typically travel to Denver much earlier in the week than they would if they were going to another city. And the reason is they want to give their body time to adjust to that higher altitude to increase naturally their levels of EPO so that when they get to game time about five days later, right, their oxygen levels have returned to normal. Now going to a high altitude place can also be used by athletes as a as a legal opportunity to increase one's hematocrit. So if you're going to run a long distance race in Muskegon, um, you could, if you really have the resources, fly to Denver, live in Denver, Denver for a week, and then during that week, your hematocrit is naturally gonna rise, and then fly back to Muskegon, and you have legally done some blood doping, and you will have an advantage in that race against those who do not have the higher hematocrit. So it's a pretty interesting uh, phenomenon, this hormone EPO. You're going to hear a lot about it now and in the urinary system as well. Another hormone uh, is thrombopoietin. You can guess what it does, right? It's a hormone that increases the production of thrombocytes of the platelets. And I told you that um, um, the fibrinogen was made in the liver, as is this. So this is a hormone produced by the liver and the kidneys a little bit, and it triggers more megakaryocytes. Megakaryocytes are the cells that we're going to see more detailed later on, are the ones that produce the platelets. And then there are a series of cytokines. We're not going to get into the details here. Cytokines, what are they? Kinetic or kine means movement. Cyto. So cytokines are chemicals that cause cells to move, to do things. And we're not going to go through any of the specific examples. But my point is, is that erythropoietin, thrombopoietin, cytokines, and there's all sorts of types. So what we're not going to go into, the interleukins and the colony st stimulating factors. These are all factors that are important in the development of the blood cells. Here's a little story about the blood doping. I think it's interesting. And there are definitely side effects of blood doping, so that's important to be mindful of as well. 
if a person has some sort of blood cancer, a leukemia, one of the ways to uh, treat that leukemia is to give them a bone marrow transplant. Why do we do that? We just mentioned that hemopoiesis is happening in the, uh, in the pelvic bone. And so when a person's getting a bone marrow transplant, what we're doing is we're gonna go into a donor, we're gonna go in and take these hemocytoblasts, these stem cells from the donor and replace them into the bone marrow of the patient with the leukemia. Now, before you do this though, you basically irradiate and destroy the cancer patient's bone marrow. And so this is why there's a little bit of risk, right? So you take the patient who's got the cancer, you basically irradiate the heck out of their bone marrow. You wipe out their ability to make blood, blood cells. And then you transplant bone marrow from a healthy person and you hope that it takes, right? That it grafts, that it now is being, uh, the, the transplant is now going to be forming the blood for that patient. And so this is a treatment that's done for leukemias. This can also be done for patients who have other blood disorders like thalassemia or sickle cell anemia. Interestingly, after a person has had their bone marrow transplant, you know, they've had a successful bone marrow transplant, those red cells, white cells, and platelets, um, if there was to be any sort of DNA analysis done of the blood, it would be discovered that it's not the same person. So remember, your, your, your uh, white blood cells are going to have the DNA of the transplanted person. So uh, every once in a while, there's an interesting who done it sort of case, and it always throws it off when there is a bone marrow transplant involved. So just to describe this process, typically uh, the pelvis in the iliac crest has a very rich supply of these hemopoietic cells. It's rather easy to get to. It's large, but it is a quite painful procedure. But every year, uh, people will give blood samples to a company that looks to see who is a possible donor. So you may donate just blood. They can look at your uh, blood cells and look at lots of features about your blood and put you into a national registry. Then if a patient with leukemia needs a, a bone marrow transplant, it's pretty picky about the compatibility. And if you turn out to be a match, right, you will be notified and you then have the opportunity if you want to become a bone marrow donor and the insurance for the person receiving the bone marrow, their insurance typically is the uh, coverage that will pay for you to donate your bone marrow free of charge. So it's a great thing to do, but it is a little bit painful in the process. So you can read about all of this here and answer a few questions. And that brings us to the end of just the production of the formed elements. Don't forget to address these questions and the vocabulary at the end. So let's head to 18.3 and take a look, closer look at erythrocytes. Erythrocytes again are red blood cells or RBC. They're by far the most common formed element making up about 99% of all of your formed elements. And in just a single small drop of blood, there are millions and millions of red blood cells and just a couple thousand, five to 10,000 or so of the white blood cells. So again, millions versus thousands. So red blood cells are by far the most common type of formed element. Now let's look at, again, here's some numbers. You gotta know these numbers. Males have around 5.4 million red blood cells per microliter. What is a microliter? A microliter, recall, is one millionth of a liter. So I will say a very small drop, right? It's a very, very small drop is one microliter. Males about 5.4, females only 4.8. 
again, having fewer red blood cells contributes to the lower hematocrit for women. In fact, red blood cells are about 25% of all the cells in your body. And they're being made constantly. We'll look at that here in a second as well. I mentioned in the blood vessel chapter uh, discussion that red blood cells are seven to eight micrometers in diameter and many books will say 7.5 even more specifically 7.5 micrometers in diameter the main job of red blood cells in fact really the only job of red blood cells is to carry oxygen okay to carry oxygen they also carry a little bit of co2 so they're carrying gases let's take a look this chart has some numbers on it I'll come back to it to review the white blood cells and platelets as well but here we go red blood cells somewhere between 4.4 and 6 million so you know around 5 million I am NOT going to be testing you on this specific specific number but I do want you to have an appreciation of the magnitude that about 5 million cells in a microliter in a small drop of blood and again they're flattened by cave shape they have no nucleus they're red in color naturally and here is the other fact the other number to keep track of red blood cells hang around for about four months they hang around for 120 days we'll come to the white blood cells greater detail in a minute but just look only five to ten thousand average of seven thousand only five to ten thousand white blood cells per microliter of blood and then we get down here to platelets in the low hundreds of thousands okay so about 150 to 500 thousand platelets per microliter of blood so this is a great table to refer back to uh, those are the numbers that are on this table that are important so what else do we need to know about red blood cells again they are formed and they mature in the red bone marrow they initially have a nucleus but they extrude or get rid of they toss out their nucleus and most of their other organelles so red blood cells are really they're not complete cells they are truly a shell of a cell and in that cell there are lots and lots of proteins called hemoglobin which are the actual um, the actual protein that carries the oxygen we'll take a look at hemoglobin here in a minute because red blood cells have lost all of their organelles they really don't have much of a metabolism what that really means is that red blood cells are perfect for transporting oxygen because they're not using up the oxygen right if if red blood cells had a metabolism they would be sucking up some of that oxygen just to do their business so red blood cells are not using up the oxygen it would sort of like be um, if we had tankers right if we had big trucks and those trucks were transporting gas it wouldn't make sense would it that the truck transporting the gas is actually siphoning off the gas up in the in the in the in the tank right for use the tr the transport truck has its own gas tank doesn't it uh, so we wouldn't want to be siphoning off the transported gas uh, to run the truck same idea we wouldn't want to be siphoning off the oxygen to run the metabolism of the erythrocytes again erythrocytes are biconcave in shape you've seen those in a couple different images kind of plump um, that increases the surface area so that oxygen can cross into these cells and the um, the oxygen and the co2 of course we know are exchanged in capillaries so in capillary beds that's where you're going to find the gas exchange going on in the capillary discussion i also mentioned that capillary beds are very narrow i'm going to give you a number here and I gave it to you also in that presentation but capillaries are about 8 to 10 micrometers in uh, in diameter 
meaning that red blood cells at 7.5 have a very tight squeeze. So erythrocytes go through a very tight space and it's in there that they are kind of folding their way up. Remember way, way back uh, in lab A, you were introduced to the topic of uh, hypotonicity and hypertonicity and you may not remember any of the details there, but what you may remember is that red blood cells can easily change their shape based upon the environment in which they're found. So red blood cells can crenate, they can shrink down, or they can plump up and even burst. Just keep that in mind that red blood cells are very flexible, very flimsy. So they can kind of jive their way through these narrow capillaries, fold themselves if they need to, and along the way, uh, pick up the oxygen. So again, there's that classic biconcave shape of red blood cells. Red blood cells have a elastic protein in them that allows some of that flexibility. So the protein that is in red blood cells is hemoglobin. So hemoglobin. IN tells us that it's a protein. It's globular in shape, meaning that it's basically a ball or a sphere, and it's found in blood, right? So hemoglobin. Uh, it is the protein that is going to carry the oxygen, and it also has iron associated with it. It turns out that hemoglobin is a four-part protein. There are four globins, and these globins are called alpha-1 and 2, beta one and two. We won't worry about which one's which, but there's alpha and beta. And in the center of each of these globins, there is a molecule called heme. Heme is actually a pigment. It's what makes blood, oxygenated blood, bright red. And each of these heme groups has an iron ion associated with it, Fe2+. So Fe is the symbol for iron. So let's take a look at a hemoglobin protein molecule. Here it is. Uh, I know it's labeled alphas and betas. We won't worry about that. But what you can see is four different shades of red, basically. Uh, that's not the way it is in nature. They're just doing that so you can differentiate that there's four globular proteins all associated together. In the center of each of these globins, it looks like a little Saturn, a little ring disc, disc here. That's the heme. The coin, if you will, is the heme. And in the center, that red dot is the iron ion. Okay, so every hemoglobin molecule has four heme groups, has four irons attached to it. And here's what's important. Each iron can attach one oxygen, one oxygen molecule. So the maximum number of oxygen that a hemoglobin protein can handle is four. Four is the maximum. And when all four oxygens are bound to the heme group, the heme burns a brighter red. And when there is less than all four, the heme is more of a dark brown or dark red color. That's that deoxygenated or lesser oxygenated blood that we've talked about. Here's another number. Every single red blood cell has within it about 300 million hemoglobin molecules. Oh my goodness. Now, if each hemoglobin can handle four oxygens, that means that every erythrocyte can carry more than a billion oxygen molecules, right? And then remember that there are four to six million red blood cells in every small drop of blood. So, wow, this is just amazing, right? The numbers are just astronomical, astronomical. But I need you to appreciate these numbers and put them into context with what's going on here. When hemoglobin goes to the lungs and picks up oxygen, all four iron ions will now have oxygen attached. When that happens again, the blood is bright red and we call that oxyhemoglobin. 
oxyhemoglobin. All it, just don't make this hard. It's just hemoglobin that's full of oxygen. When the any of the oxygens are released, again, the hemoglobin is a darker red, and we call that deoxyhemoglobin, right? We have deoxygenated blood associated with the hemoglobin. Now, there's also a fair amount of CO2, carbon dioxide, that is bound to the red blood cells, and that is called carbaminohemoglobin, right? So we see basically just looks like carbon in the front, right? Carb carbon dioxide in the front. So red blood cells can have a major effect on your overall oxygenation, right? If you're low in red blood cells, as we described, that's going to give you a low hematocrit. If you have a low hematocrit, we're going to call that you're anemic. Now, there's another thing that somebody can do for anemia. Anemia is also highly connected to iron levels. So if you are low in iron, you're probably going to be low in your hematocrit. Because if you don't have adequate iron in your body, you cannot make adequate hemoglobin, right? The body can't make a protein if it doesn't have the building products. So if you are low in iron, your body can't make enough red blood cells. You are therefore going to be anemic. You're going to feel weak, right? You're going to feel weak. And uh, what do you do for anemia, right? You eat spinach. You take an iron supplement uh, that can also help to overcome anemia. Like I said earlier too, if uh, you uh, produce too many red blood cells, you have polycythemia. And what polycythemia does, why it's risky, is that if you have too many red blood cells, it actually causes your blood to become more viscous. And if your blood becomes thicker, more viscous, it can't transport the blood through the body as well. So like the three bears, right? Uh, mama bear, papa bear, and baby bear, you want just the right amount of, of, uh, of red blood cells. You want enough to carry the oxygen, but too much is not good either. If you have too low of oxygen levels in your blood, you are said to be hypoxic or you are said to have hypoxemia, right? Again, emia, an abnormal condition of the blood, hypo low ox oxygen so a low level of oxygen in your blood is hypoxemia again your kidneys are measuring that and if they determine that your blood does not have enough it will release the epo okay and that will go to your kidneys sorry leave the kidneys go to your bone marrow and tell you to create more red blood cells Again, altitude has an effect. So if you live in a place of high altitude, then you are naturally gonna have a higher hematocrit level than people who live at sea level. So if you were to go to a Denver hospital and look at the range of normal hematocrits, you would see that the average normal is higher in, in Denver than it is here in West Michigan. So those ranges are just that. Um, there, I'm not going to say there's a set number based upon where you live, the average hematocrit value would change. And again, um, another application of this is that if you are going to be climbing, let's say Mount Everest or K2, right? you're going to go to the Himalayas and you're going to go up to a high altitude mountain. Why is it that mountain climbers um, go pretty slowly? They go up the mountain pretty slowly because it's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of work uh, to be going up a mountain. But also, if they were to go up the mountain too quickly, as the atmospheric pressure changes, their body would not get enough oxygen. So what you see is that mountain climbers climb a little ways, they make a camp, they wait a couple of days, and then they wait for that hematocrit to start building up again and then they go a little further and then they you know wait and then they go a little further because if they don't then they will get altitude sickness which is basically where they climb too quickly and they become very hypoxic right so you got to go take days uh to go up the mountain even though you could physically climb faster you've got to take your time 
so that you don't have that problem. And then of course, if you go to real high altitudes, uh, many mountain climbers will bring oxygen to with them to um, overcome that low atmospheric pressure. Now, red blood cells. More than 2 million of these cells are produced every second. One second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, right? You are making 2 million red blood cells every second. So you must have adequate building blocks for your red blood cells. The number one building block is iron. You've got to have iron to make the hemoglobin to work. So iron, 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 got to have it, got to have it, got to have it. Um, that's the number one thing you must have. You must also have adequate copper levels and zinc and B vitamins, most specifically vitamin B12. Okay, so what do cells need to make red blood cells besides just all the cellular stuff? They must have iron, copper, zinc, and B vitamins, specifically B12. Again, erythrocytes live for about 120 days. When they're worn out, they're removed by macrophages that hang out primarily in the liver and the spleen. I want you to make a connection here with the capillaries. Recall that in the liver and the spleen, there are sinusoid capillaries, capillaries with big gaping holes in them. And when you get to that blood vessel talk, and you hear about the sinusoid capillaries, remember this, that in order to get those red blood cells in and out of circulation, right, the liver and spleen must have sinusoid capillaries. Now, um, I'll go down here to a diagram in a minute, but heme, well, let me back up. When red blood cells are recycled, right, when they only live for 120 days, but when they go through that process of being broken down, much of it is recycled. The iron will be recycled. So the iron that's in hemoglobin will be stored in the liver or the spleen and will become a source of iron. Okay, so the iron is basically recycled and reused. The globin part of hemoglobin, the protein part, that's broken down all the way down into basically amino acids. Um, and those amino acids can then be used to make other proteins. The non-iron portion of the heme, the little dime section of the heme group, that is broken down. And interestingly, that heme group, as it breaks down, breaks down into a number of other substances that are green and yellow and dark in color. When you, let me, let me give you three examples of where you see this color. In your urine, the main reason that your urine is yellow is because um, there are substances, they are breakdown products of heme that make the urine yellow. Why are your feces brown? Because the, these breakdown products uh, actually in the gut are converted to a substance which is dark in color. And after you bruise yourself, why does that bruise go through a greenish and yellow and purplish, right? We've all seen bruises change colors. Well, what's going on is that when you bruise your, your body, um, blood cells, right, were let out. Uh, there was some damage to your blood vessels in that area and that leaked out blood is being degraded and you're going to see the greens and the yellows and the and the dark colors associated with all of these colors right in a bruise as it heals so again that's all mentioned here and let's just take a look at the life cycle if you will of a red blood cell so let's think about it let's to go through this whole story so here we are in the head of the humerus. We know that in the head of the humerus, there are stem cells called hemocytoblasts. Those hemocytoblasts, the myeloid stem cell side, can form red blood cells. Those red blood cells are going to spit out their nucleus and all their other organelles, and they're going to travel through the blood, through the blood 
for about 120 days. What they're doing is carrying oxygen and CO2 primarily. Once we've reached about 120 days, those red blood cells sort of get old and ragged. As blood passes through the spleen, remember the spleen is filtering your blood looking for pathogens, and the liver also filters your blood looking for uh, substances that could hurt you. It's where you detoxify a lot of substances carried by the blood. So within the liver and the spleen, there are macrophages. Those macrophages are in the business of breaking down the red blood cells. The red blood cells are broken down into their components. Again, the cellular components are broken down the, uh, into the protein components, or are broken down into amino acids, which are then used for other proteins. But the iron group is recycled. It's carried to the liver and the spleen and then reused. And the heme group is going through a series of breakdown steps. I'm not going to get into the names of all those, but it goes into all of these uh, steps that uh, one of those substances is called bilirubin. And bilirubin goes to the liver and is further broken down. Now, many newborns, when they're born, their liver has not yet woken up. That's how I'm going to say it. And because their liver is not yet functioning fully, the, the heme groups, as they break down to bilirubin, the liver is unable to break that bilirubin down any further. These are the babies who get jaundice, right? They start showing uh, a yellowing of the eyes, and we put those babies under blue lights, typically. And that blue light actually helps to convert the bilirubin and break the bilirubin down until the liver has a chance to kind of wake up and become fully functioning. So that's sort of the, the roundabout life cycle of red blood cells. Another disease that is associated with red blood cells is sickle cell anemia. I'll let you read through this. We did talk a little bit about sickle cell anemia way, 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 way back. Uh, not much, but it is a mutation in hemoglobin. And as a result, let me go down to this picture. As a result, the red blood cells become sickle in shape. They, they, they get really long and pointy ends. Well, remember what we said? Red blood cells are seven and a half microns in diameter. If the red blood cells suddenly become sickled in shape because of this mutation, these sickled red blood cells are now too big to fit through capillaries. And these jagged ends cause the red blood cells to cause blockages in the capillaries. Well, if you block capillaries and you block blood vessels, you're now robbing tissues and organs of oxygen. So in the sickling moments, uh, these patients have, they, they sustain tissue damage and organ damage. And you can imagine that if they have enough of these sickling events over time, their liver, their kidneys, their brain, their heart, all their major organs can sustain significant tissue damage. And so if that's not controlled, people with sickle cell anemia are going to have a shortened lifespan from some sort of tissue damage. The hemoglobin, what's going on? Remember I told you there's about 300 million hemoglobin molecules inside each and every red blood cell. Well, the mutation that leads to sickle cell anemia actually causes, this is an easy way to think about it, but it causes those hemoglobin molecules to get sticky and they all stick to each other in a long row. That stickiness of the hemoglobin molecules causes the red blood cell to elongate, to change its shape. And we talked about how red blood cells are very flexible. And so those proteins that are inside the red blood cell are causing the entire cell to change its shape. So sickle cell anemia, um, sickle cell because of the shape that the cells take on, anemia because this form of hemoglobin, this, this mutated form of hemoglobin, isn't quite as good at carrying oxygen either. So individuals with sickle cell anemia are always, quote, anemic. They don't have good oxygen carrying capacity on their mutated uh, hemoglobin. So 
can read a little bit more about sickle cell anemia. It really is a very interesting disease. Another disease of the blood is thalassemia, uh, whereas sickle cell anemia is more commonly seen in African populations. Thalassemia is more commonly seen in Mid Middle East and folks in the Mediterranean and Southeast Asia areas. Again, it's another problem with hemoglobin and it leads to anemia. It just is a different reason for the anemia. Okay, and again, polycythemia is an elevated red blood cell count compared to others. The major problem here is that the blood gets a little thick and that thickness uh, makes the blood more difficult to travel through the blood delivering oxygen. So that brings us to the end of 18.3. You should be able to address all of the questions here, including the vocabulary. And the last section, 18.4, let's learn a little bit more about leukocytes and platelets. Okay, so let's go through the white blood cells or the leukocytes first. And again, these are the cells that are all about defense. They are fighting off disease. They are an integral part of your lymphatic system. And uh, some of the leukocytes, again, protect against invading microorganisms like bacteria or fungi or uh, also against viruses. Some of these cells also are cleaning up debris. Your macrophages are going around and cleaning up all the garbage. Uh, and then you have other uh, white blood cells that are designed to fight off cancerous cells. We'll also talk about platelets at the end of this unit, and you know that they're involved with blood clotting. So a couple of things. Again, I keep saying it over and over and over. Uh, white blood cells and red blood cells, both are formed in the bone marrow from those hemopoietic stem cells, the hemocytoblasts. And back to that chart we saw a long time ago, there are only 5,000 to 10,000 white blood cells per microliter or per little tiny drop of blood, right? Much, much, or far, far fewer than the millions of red blood cells. Also, white blood cells are larger than erythrocytes, okay? So they are larger. So if you're looking at a red blood cell, something larger is gonna be a white blood cell, something smaller is going to be a platelet. And also important, they are the only formed element that are, quote, complete cells having all of the organelles and a nucleus, okay? Which means that if you are at a crime scene and you are collecting blood samples for DNA analyses, the red blood cells don't have a nucleus. Platelets, as we'll see, are not cells at all and don't have a nucleus. So the only cells that are providing DNA information in a blood sample taken at a crime scene are the white blood cells. They're the only cells in the blood, the only formed elements that have DNA. Now, one of the things about white blood cells different from red blood cells. Red blood cells spend their entire lifespan circulating in the, in the blood vessels. That's what they do. But white blood cells, yes, they circulate in the blood, but they oftentimes leave the bloodstream and they go into the tissues and there they fight off the infection, okay? So if a bacterium um, is detected in your body, chemical signals are sent out and as a result, white blood cells are going to leave the capillaries through a process called emigration, right? Removal, emigration, or another name for it is diaphoresis. And basically, those white blood cells are going to squeeze out through the little gaps between the endothelial cells in the capillary wall. And they are then going to travel and watch this video to really understand this. Other white blood cells um, are not constantly traveling around in the blood. Instead, they get taken up by lymphatic organs. So your spleen, thymus, tonsils, lymph nodes are full of lymphocytes that are taking up residence in those lymphatic organs. So they're not just floating around all the time. And they move. So where you have an infection, uh, if you have a bacterial infection, one of the types of white blood cells called neutrophils 
will run to that site of infection, will release chemicals which are designed to destroy bacteria. And then if there was another infection somewhere else, cells would go there. So again, the white blood cells are very movable. They're, they're, they're not just in the, site, in, the, in the blood vessels. And that's a significant difference between them and red blood cells. The book calls it sort of like a 911 call, right? So the, the, the cell is in trouble. There's some sort of infection. So we see here in this picture that there's been a cut. Bacteria have been introduced. We can see this right there is the basement membrane. So this is all epithelial cells. So if you just get a little scratch and you get bacteria in your epithelial cells, probably not a big deal, right? Because your body can deal with that locally. But if you get those bacteria down into the dermis, right, that can become a much bigger issue. Signals are going to be sent from the cells and white blood cells are going to perceive that and white blood cells are now going to come to the rescue. So these little guys, these red blood cells, notice how much larger the white blood cells are. And basically, the white blood cells are going to squeeze through the capillary wall. That's the diapedesis. And they're going to come to the rescue. And they're going to release their chemical signals that are going to destroy the bacteria. Then they're also the very largest cells, the macrophages. And they are going to come along and eat up. The debris and also try to clear out the bacteria. So question, what color is pus? Right, if you have a scratch and that scratch gets infected, you will oftentimes see pus around the, the wound. Well, pus is how white blood cells got their name. Pus is basically dead neutrophils that have come to the rescue. They're dead white blood cells. They came to the rescue. They came to the site of infection. They did their battling. They have a relatively short lifespan. They sort of die in the process. And all of those white blood cells cumulatively look like or are the pus that you see. So if you see pus in a wound, you know that uh, your immune system has gone, you know, gone crazy to help remove and destroy that infection. Now, white blood cells, again, come in a number of different types. Here's what I want you to know. So listen carefully. I'm going to mark those things that you need to know. First, white blood cells come in two groups. Two groups. They're called the granular leukocytes and the agranular leukocytes. Granular leukocytes have what looks like little granules within the cytoplasm. A granular leukocytes don't, right? A granular means without granules. What cells are granular leukocytes? Neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. I remember that Ben, B E N, Ben has granules, right? Ben has bumps, if you will. And then the other two groups, the macrophages and the lymphocytes, do not have these granular appearances. So if you look at cartoon representations of the five main types of white blood cells, notice that the eosinophil, the basophil, and the neutrophil, you can see the granular substances within the cytoplasm. Now, what are these granules? We now know that these are little vesicles and they are designed to fight off something. So the neutrophil, again, is the white blood cell that specifically fights off uh, bacterial infections. So the neutrophil goes up to the bacterium, spews out the contents of its little granules. There's bleach and other antibacterial uh, compounds in there. An eosinophil, those little granules in here, instead, they're designed to kill off parasites. So worms and parasites. So if you have an intestinal parasite, more eosinophils would come to the rescue, release their products, which are designed specifically to break down parasites. Okay. Over here, the monocytes and the lymphocytes are lacking those obvious granular categories. So that, that's just the way that these cells are organized, the granular versus the agranular cells. Here is a 
micrograph of red of white blood cells. Now, what I want you to see and what I want you to appreciate, red blood cells, that's what we're seeing here. Red blood cells are red, right? Heme itself is a pigment. So red blood cells are naturally red. White blood cells, though, are not naturally purple or uh, you know, pink. This pink and purple coloring that you're seeing is from dyes that have been added to the sample. So you take a blood smear, you take some blood, right? you poke your finger, take some blood, and then before you look at it under the microscope, you add some dyes to the blood. And those stains cause the appearance that we're seeing here. Well, it turns out one of those stains is called eosin. Eosin is a reddish, orangey colored dye. Well, we know what fill means, right? If you have a um, uh, fill means an affinity for. Remember we had hydrophilic and hydrophobic. So fill means an affinity. So all this means is that eosinophils are white blood cells that have an affinity for this dye called eosin. And what it does is it causes the cell to have sort of this reddish granular appearance. The other dye that is added is a basic dye. And that basic dye causes some cells, the basophil, to become very bluish black. So I remember the basophils become bluish black because of a basic dye. They have an affinity for it. So isn't it interesting that the different white blood cells got their name, at least some of them did, based upon their affinity for the two dyes that were commonly used to stain blood. So basophils stain dark, eosinophils stain more of an orangey red, neutrophils, as the name suggests, don't have a strong affinity. So the granular components stay sort of neutral in their color. Monocytes and lymphocytes don't have these granules, so we don't see those. The telltale sign of a lymphocyte, look how big that nucleus is, okay? So a lymphocyte has a very, very, very large nucleus. It takes up the vast majority of the cytoplasm. That's the telltale identifying feature of lymphocytes. Notice too, how much bigger all of these white blood cells are compared to the red blood cells that are also shown in these micrographs. So what do I want you to know? I've already said it, let me find it in the words and what I'm highlighting is what you are responsible for, okay? Number one, neutrophils, and, and these are listed in the order of their occurrence. Neutrophils are the most numerous, right? They're the most numerous. They're the most common. Neutrophil numerous. They comprise a large percentage of all of your white blood cells. What do neutrophils do? Neutrophils are hugely important in fighting off bacterial infections. So what I want you to know is that they are responding to Neutrophils respond to the site of infection specifically for bacteria. So if you have a bacterial infection, you better believe, if all is well, that you're going to recruit many of those white bloods. Those neutrophils are going to uh, emigrate out of the capillaries. They're undergoing diapedesis. They're going to travel to the site of infection. They're going to release things that are antimicrobial. I'm not having you memorize these things but they're releasing antimicrobial substances, okay, that help kill off bacteria. My friends, that's what I want you to know. Neutrophils are the most numerous and they fight off bacteria. Okay, we're gonna keep this simple. Eosinophils, okay, they represent a much lower percentage, so they're nowhere near as common. And their claim to fame, their claim to fame is that they, two things, they are all about destroying, let me find it, they're all about destroying parasitic worms. So if you were to uh, travel to a place where there are more parasites in the food and you had a parasitic worm, you would expect 
to see an increase in the number of eosinophils that are going through your body to uh, destroy that. So where do we get these parasitic worms? We can get it from under cooked fish or pork or meat. Those, that's why we cook our meat so that we can kill those parasitic uh, invaders. The other thing that eosinophils do is they also release um, a number of molecules that are involved with inflammatory responses. Uh, you may have heard even on TV commercials for asthma. Some asthma um, can be triggered by eosinophils. So when a person, some people are just more sensitive to it, but we know that some asthma is eosinophilic induced. Uh, so it causes an inflammatory response. That inflammatory response can inflame the lungs and make breathing more difficult. So I just wanted to point that out. But mostly, right, we're dealing with parasitic worm infections and those experiencing allergies are the folks that are going to have increased numbers of eosinophils. Basophils, they are the, num the, the least abundant. Their numbers are in, the way I remember, in the basement. So they're the least common of the leukocytes, right, making up a very small percentage. And their job, their job, the basophil's job, is to, and this is the only thing I really want you to know, is that they release um, histamine. Okay, they release histamines. And histamines contribute also to infl inflammation. So let's talk about these for a moment. Um, you're going to have a higher number of basophils if you're having an allergic response. Why is that? And we've all experienced this, right? If you go outside and you are experiencing pollen, right? You're having an allergic response to the pollen and you're sneezing and your eyes are watering and all that's going on. What are most people going to do, right? They're going to run to Walgreens. They're going to buy some antihistamines. They're going to take the antihistamines to stop the body from tearing and sneezing. What's the body trying to do? Right? When you are tearing and sneezing, the body is trying to get rid of the pollen, get it out of your body. But instead, we go to Walgreens and we take antihistamines, which stop that response. And basically, the allergen stays in us. Uh, but we've kind of minimized the symptoms. Okay, So that's the story I want to tell you about the basophils. Then we have the agranular leukocytes. We're not going to get fancy here. These are the lymphocytes. These are coming in all sorts of flavors, the B cells, the T cells. We're not going to get into all of the details here. I mentioned lymphocytes just a little bit more when you're in the lymphatic discussion. And then finally, there are, um, we're just going to skip over all these specifics. I told you in the lymphatic talk that B cells, B cells form antibodies. So that was the one thing I did want you to know. And that T cells are more about uh, T cells are more about fighting off cancer cells and cells uh, infected with viruses. And then finally, we get down to again. If I'm skipping over, you don't need to worry about it. We're now going down to monocytes. That's the fifth and final type. These are also a granular cells. They represent two to eight percent. And the monocytes are the cells that become the macrophages. So macrophages are basically monocytes that have left the blood circulation and have taken up residence in their new place. Again, examples of macrophages that you've seen this semester are osteoclasts found in bone, Langerhans cells found in skin, um, and uh, microglia cells found in the brain. And we are going to see more types of macrophages when we look at the liver, when we look at other tissues as well. So that's pretty much the story on the white blood cells that I want you to know. And then, oh, one more thing. Uh, white blood cells have a, usually, most have a relatively short lifespan, like hours or days, hours or days. But there are some that stick around for months and years, right? These are cells that we say have memory, and are able to make antibodies for a long period of time, but most relatively short. So when a 
white blood cell runs to an infection it dies in the in the uh in the process of trying to fight off that infection so most are short-lived there are a number of different types of leukemia i'm not going to go into the four different types so i'm not going to test you on this but there is uh there are four different types of leukemia so it's chronic myeloid chronic lymphocytic and then there's acute myeloid and acute lymphocytic leukemia they're all slightly different um, if you're interested in that you can read and watch the videos but i'm not going to test you on that a couple of terms that you need to know remember we had the term anemia and polycythemia to represent low red blood cells and high red blood cells if a person has low white blood cells we're going to say that they have leukopenia so remember, five to ten thousand is normal. So if you have less than five thousand, you would be considered to be leukopenic. If you have more than the ten thousand normal number, you have leukocytosis. Osis, an abnormal condition, right, or a condition uh, where you have too many white blood cells. Leukemia is a cancer involving leukocytes. It, there's all kinds of leukemias. So leukemias are basically one of the cancer cells is crazy, right? Gone out of control. And the person is making way too many of those immature leukocytes. And those, the problem with leukemia is that all those cancer cells don't act properly and they begin to compromise the person's immune system. And uh, that is what leads to the death. And then there's also lymphomas. You've heard about lymphomas. These are a form of cancer, but these are masses of cells. And these cells accumulate in the lymph nodes and the other lymphatic tissues. So lymphomas are also typically, some of them are, are treatable, but some of the lymphomas are pretty bad news. And uh, basically what you've got is a collection of cancerous T cells hanging out in your lymphatic tissues. I'm not going to test you on this, but you may have heard of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or Hodgkin's lymphoma. So again, you can read about those, watch the videos on those, but I won't be testing you on those specifically. Finally, let's get to platelets and then we're done. Platelets, um, thrombocytes, the other name for them. They are not cells at all. They're little fragments. And I've said this word, but let's look at this. Platelets are derived from megakaryocytes. So let's just take a look at this word and figure out what it means mega large karyo remember what karyo means karyo refers to the nucleus so this is a cell with a very large nucleus hence their name so when you look at mega karyocytes and we'll see one in a minute they simply are cells in the bone marrow with a huge nucleus so the mega karyocytes are in the bone marrow and what happens is that these little pieces spew off little cytoplasmic fragments break off so thousands of these little cytoplasmic fragments break off from hemocytoblasts and that is what a platelet is okay and every mary megakaryocyte is able to release two to three thousand platelets during its lifespan megakaryocytes can replace themselves they're normal cells they have a nucleus so again what's going on from the myeloid stem cell that we learned about. There is a particular uh, protein called thrombopoietin, right? It's made in the liver and the kidneys, sort of like erythropoietin, but it causes an increase in thrombocytes. The myeloid stem cell then is changed to become a megakaryocyte. Megakaryocytes are the cells that bleb off, these little pieces that bleb off become the platelets. Platelets are very small. They're only two to four micrometers. So they're about one fourth to one half the size of a red blood cell. They are numbered in the low hundreds of thousands and they're floating around the body and they hang around for about 10 days. Okay, so seven to 10 days is the lifespan of platelets. Let's put all this in perspective, right? Red blood cells hang out for 120 days platelets only hang out for 10 days. White blood cells hang out, it's variable, right? From hours to days 
to even weeks and years. So uh, there isn't really a hard and fast lifespan of white blood cells. So here, platelets are normally sort of smooth little fragments. When they become activated, that is when there is a cut to your blood vessels, chemical signals cause the platelets to activate, and then they are a major part of your blood clot. Uh, and we're not going to go into the stage, stages or steps of blood clotting. Um, that's a section that you will learn about next semester, hemostasis. Likewise to what we just talked about, if a person has a low number of platelets, we say they have thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia, if a patient has thrombocytopenia, they're not going to clot their blood well. Okay. Again, this is a side effect that's seen in liver patients because they're not making adequate proteins to cause the formation of platelets. And if you have too many platelets, you have thrombocytosis. That's a problem because if you have too many platelets, you can start triggering unwanted blood clots. People die from thromboses. They die from blood clots to the lung or to the brain or to any other organ. So uh, too many, like so many things, right? Too many platelets, we get a problem. Too few platelets, we have a problem as well. So let me, we're done here with this chapter. Let me just ask one question while we've got these words on the table. Um, what are, and then we'll be done, what are the side effects of individuals who are on chemotherapy? Chemotherapy, a person has cancer, they're given chemotherapy. The purpose of the chemotherapy is to destroy rapidly growing cells, isn't it? Is to destroy the cancer. But people who take chemotherapy agents also have some significant side effects. What are those side effects? Well, they lose their hair. Why do they lose their hair? Because hair is fast growing. And so the chemo agents destroy the hair roots. Okay, now it's temporary. Hair usually comes back once the chemo is stopped. People on chemotherapy don't taste well because their taste buds are rapidly growing cells. They have nausea and diarrhea. Why? The epithelial cells lining the gut are rapidly growing, quickly replaced cells. So they shed their epithelial linings of their intestines and their stomach, so they have diarrhea and nausea. But related to this conversation, people on chemotherapy also complain of having low energy. They are anemic, red blood cells, man, we're making 2 million per second. They're fast growing cells. So chemotherapy destroys red blood cells. So the patients are anemic. Patients who are on um, chemo also are, auto, are, are immunocompromised. Why? Their white blood cells are wiped out. And patients on chemo have blood clotting issues. Why? As we're looking here, they have inadequate numbers of thrombocytes. Okay, because the megakaryocytes, again, are relatively rapidly growing and we interfere with the ability to make platelets. So that explains why people with chemotherapy, right, are having all of those side effects and you can now better appreciate those side effects. Heading down, again, at the very end, you should be able to answer all of these questions and address the vocabulary terms at the end.